Good morning. It's good to see you all today. I, I wish I could see your full faces, but thank you for complying with masking and social distancing to keep your neighbor safe uh, as an expression of our love for our neighbors. So thank you for that for the time being. A uh, couple of up, good upsets yesterday. If you watch the playoff games, we've got Super Roll Sunday coming up. And so as you can see, we're collecting all things on rolls, toilet paper, paper towels, Kleenex, um, Clorox wipes. We're going to donate those things to the food shelf. So please participate that, in that as you wish to bring those by the 13th. We'll have a congregational meeting on the 6th after worship, 10 a.m. The following weekend as well, uh, Super Roll weekend. We'll have a yap and mentor meeting. Um, and then finally, the confirmation retreat that was supposed to be um, last weekend or two weekends ago is rescheduled for President's Day, I think President's Day weekend in February. So another Sunday, Monday that the kids have off. With that, uh, our radio and online services and flowers are given in memory of Jordan Martinson from Mike and Kim Thompson, so we thank them for those. And you can stand as you're able and greet one another from a distance. Wave to those joining us online, and we'll begin worship. Continue worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ in training and by its authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Our lector is Delane and Gebertson. The psalm this morning is Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the story of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voices are not heard. Yet their voices, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. In the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy. And like a strong man, it comes with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect receiving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing, let's see, re rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether more to be desired than pure gold than gold even much fine gold sweeter than also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb moreover by them is your servant warned in keeping them there is great reward but who can detect their errors clear me from hidden faults keep back your servants also from the insolent do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to think of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, I am, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a, a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, many members, yet one body. The, the eye cannot say to the hand, if I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem, that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the members of the body that were, 
that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor, and our less respectable members are treated with great, greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this, but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no discussion within the body, but the members may have their have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership. Various kinds of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but strive for the greater gift, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel this morning is a reading from St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. And when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And you may be seated. Well, I'm sure you've heard of the... A saying, timing is everything. You've maybe even said that yourself, but here's the thing, a question for you. Do you know how to tell the time? Do you know how to tell the time? Maybe you think it's, well, it's uh, uh, 9.17 on Sunday morning. Am I pretty close there? 9.17, 9.18? Uh, a lot of you look at your watches right before the sermon, I'm sure, because you're trying to figure out the time also, right? Uh, uh, or maybe the time is Tuesday morning at, uh, you know, 8.15, and all that's in front of you uh, at your desk is a pile of invoices that you have to go through. Or maybe it's 6.30 on a Wednesday evening, and time, uh, it's time to start the kids on their homework. Or maybe it's 7.30 Saturday morning, and time finally to sleep in, right? You get to sleep in, or... Maybe the time is 3 a.m. in the morning, and your worries in life are keeping you from sleeping. So that's the time. Those are the times that we mark in our lives, and uh, that's part of the story. But the other part of telling time is knowing, is believing, is even trusting that God is at work all the time. God is at work all the time in our worship and in our work and in our family life and in our relationships. God is at work all the time. 
So knowing how to tell the time is always knowing the time that God is caring for and redeeming us, caring for and redeeming the world. So the question becomes, how do you look at the maybe what you think the ordinary, mundane kind of elements in times of your life? How would you look at that if you believed that God was with you and that God was working through you and that God was using you to care for God's people? Well, because of Jesus, whatever time we think it may be, it is always God's time. Always God's time. And when God is around, all things are possible. This, I believe, is directly to the point of Jesus saying at the end of the Scripture lesson for today. Jesus says, Today the Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus says that now, in the present, right now, this time, in this day, this time, the Scripture has been fulfilled. Now is the time, Jesus is saying. Now by this point in Luke's Gospel, Jesus, the hometown boy, had just been baptized. If you remember, he's, been, uh, already, he's already received his call to ministry. He has survived the wilderness and the 40 days of uh, temptation, and he had already begun teaching and healing, and now he was finally going home. He was going home to Nazareth, that small rural town that uh, served him in his childhood, that helped him to grow in his childhood. So he was returning to those who knew him the best, to the adults, who had watched him grow, to the adults who had helped him to grow. And the language of Jesus' first sermon that we receive here in the lesson today should sound familiar to them. Its tone, its topics, its concerns are what he shared in common with that rural town of Nazareth where he grew up. It's what he shared in common with his family, with his father, and with his Mother. In fact, it was his mother Mary who first gave witness and words of her son's ministry. And maybe you remember these words. When Mary said earlier in the Gospel of Luke, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. So Jesus probably first learned what it means to bring good news to the poor from the stories that he heard from his mother or from his father. Jesus watched his mother and listened to Mary and saw her as someone who not only knew the good news, but proclaimed the good news. She lived out the good news in her life as Jesus watched her. So as soon as his hometown crowd learned that he would be speaking in the synagogue, all the people from that small town, they returned and they filled the room waiting for him to arrive. After all, it was Jesus' first sermon in his hometown. And so Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus said, because God has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. And you could just hear maybe the widows of Nazareth in the back saying, oh, thank goodness, finally there'll be some relief for me. Oh, Lord, thank goodness for this message. We need that blessing, you could almost hear them saying. And then Jesus kept on, the Lord has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Amen. Pretty good sermon. Pretty good sermon. Now, if you could choose the words that might encapsulate 
that might represent who you are as a person and who God has called you to be as a person, I'm wondering what words you would use as you think about your own life. What words would you use to represent you as as a person that would communicate the essence of yourself, your life, your commitments? What words would would they be? What words would you use? When it comes to Luke, this first sermon, these few words uh, are Jesus' choice words for himself. These words are essentially Jesus' life. They are Jesus' ministry. They are Jesus' purpose in a nutshell. And what's fascinating about how Luke tells the story is that, if you noticed it, it happens in real time. Did you notice that? It happens in real time, meaning that it, it, the time that it takes to read the story is the total time of the actual event. So that's interesting to think about. Jesus' words, in summary, is not sufficient. When we're talking about God, an abridged or condensed witness does not work at all. It needs to be in real time. So Jesus' words are a call to real life, a call to real people, to real time. And this is God in our present and in our reality. This is God in our time. So I want to tell you a phrase that you never read in the Bible. It's never found in the Bible. And here's the phrase. Are you ready? It's actually a question. Where do you go to church? It's never in the Bible. Never in the Bible. In fact, it's kind of interesting. There is no place in the Bible that actually says that you should go to church. Doesn't happen in the Bible. There is a real important reason for this. It doesn't mean that you should stop going to church, right? Doesn't mean that you should stop joining us online, that you should stop worshiping with us on Facebook, by the way, did we get a chance to greet the people on Facebook this morning? All right, well, let's say hello to them. So just because the Bible doesn't tell you to go to church, that doesn't mean that we should stop going to church, just so you're clear about that, all right? In the time when the New Testament books were written, nobody thought about calling a building a church. That just wasn't in their thought process. They didn't even have any buildings for church people to gather into in the new church. They just had people. They just had people. The people were the church. And a strange strange thing happened over the centuries. What used to be the name of the people became the name of the building, the church. And sometimes in our day, people will look at a building where church people gather and they'll say, well, you have a beautiful church. Have you ever heard that before or have you said that before? Well, you have a beautiful church. So so, uh, in the early church, that would make absolutely no sense to them. To early Christians, that would be like somebody in our day looking at a crib, like in your child's room, looking at a crib and saying, well, you have a beautiful baby, just looking at the crib. Uh, A baby is a person, right? Babies are people. A crib is a thing. A crib is just a place where you place the baby. You don't even put the baby in there all the time, right? You just put the baby in there so that they can rest up, right? So they can recharge and go back into the world. The world where all the action is. There's not much action in the crib. The action is out in, outside the crib, out in the world. The baby was made for the world. The baby was not made for the crib. The baby loves being in the world. That's why babies crawl out of the crib whenever they can, right? Uh, If you have a baby, would you want them in the crib 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Well, no. No, you wouldn't want them. Uh, 
Maybe if you have a baby right now and you're exhausted right now, maybe that sounds pretty good for the baby to be in the crib 24 hours a day. But that's not what the baby was made for. The baby is not made for the crib. The baby is made for the world. Here's another phrase that you would never read in the Bible. Hey, how was church today? That's nothing that's ever in the Bible. People ask that sometimes in our day, right? Usually on a Sunday. How was church today? And it usually means, how did a particular service go, right? Uh, Or how did a particular hour go? Or, you know, what was the music like today? Was it your kind of music or was it not your kind of music? How was church today? Did you like it? How did the sermon go? How much did you like the sermon? By the way, how is church today? How is the sermon going for you? (laughs) Don't answer that. Is church going okay? Or what happened? So, you, you see my point? We got way off on this. We measure church by how was that one little group of people on that were present in that one room on one building during that one hour. How are they doing? And we got kind of messed up about that. This tendency to compartmentalize, to restrict the church to a particular place or a particular time crops up over and over and over again. And God never likes that. God never intended that. It wasn't God's idea. In fact, a real good question is to ask, where does God think the church is? Where does God think the church is? And how does God think the church went today? That's a good question to ask. After all, the whole church thing was God's idea. So I don't want you to come to church I want you to be the church. Be the church. I believe God has a mission for you in his world. And guess what? It's a lot like the mission of the one that we follow. It's a lot like the mission of the one that we're named after, Christians. We are named after Christ. So our mission is Jesus' mission in the world. And that's what God calls us to be. God calls us to be the church. And I want to call every single one of us who is a follower of Jesus to not just come to the crib, but to identify and own the mission God has for us, that God has for you, for the world that God loves. Now, it doesn't have to be grandiose. We all can't get sucked into this thing of, well, I have to change the world. I have to share everything that I'm doing so that I'm the church. It doesn't have to uh, impress anybody. It just has to be real. And it has to be real for you. Because that's what God calls you in your time to be real. To be real. Because we follow this Jesus. And God's idea of the church is that the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you as well. So how is church today? How is church today? Well, we don't know yet because it's not about what happens here inside these walls. This is just what? This is just the crib, right? This is just the crib. So welcome to the crib. Welcome to the crib. God calls the church out beyond the crib into the world. And we want to be that church, don't we? We really want to be that church in the world. The most beautiful church in the world is the church that is actually in the world. Out of the crib, in the world. So I'm glad you came here to the crib today. I'm glad that you guys joined us at the crib today. I hope it's been a great gathering. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been nurtured. I hope you've been inspired. I hope you've been touched by God. Now go out. Now go out about the mission of the one who you follow, the mission of Jesus, because it's 
time. It's the perfect time to be the church. As God's people, the church, uh, I invite you to stand as you are able as we offer prayers to be encouraged as the church. Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, all creation tells of your glory. From night to day, moon and sun and stars, witness to the light and love with which you reign from on high. Let us learn from your beloved creation, that we too are your beloved children. Enliven us to be witnesses too to all you're doing in and around and with and through us, that the time of your action in the world is now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of one body, we give you thanks for the diversity of your body here on earth. Just as our physical bodies are made up of many parts, each with its own value, so your spiritual body is made of different people, each with their own value. As you live and reign three in one and one in three, so also unify us, your people, in our differences, that we may wholeheartedly serve you as your church, as your real people, to see your kingdom come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God, our stronghold, renew the strength of all your people who suffer in body and spirit, including the following from our congregation. Greg Tukolke, Claris Olson, Jack Flayton, Jim Anderson, Tom Beals, Ken Club, Monica Kennedy, Brad Madsen, Lauren Thone, Julie Miron, Joey Anderson Ernest, John Perry Peterson, Mike Thompson, Asher Fierkenstad, Ken Menning, Christy Peterson Thomas, Anne Hag Thone, Aurora Bukowski, Arliss Buer, Doug Breberg, Evelyn Lundgren, Linda Tollickson, Madeline Wilton Gustafson, Lucille Williams, Deb Trapp, Joy Winningstad, Bob Pearson, the family of Raiden Gordon, and McCoy Lee. Lord, in your mercy. We commend all these prayers to you, O God, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we turn to our thanksgiving for the word. Uh, we are not passing on an offering plate, as you know, but there are plates in the back for you to give, or you can give online um, as God's people. Go, O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, Son our Lord. I believe by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Go in peace, share the good news.